This one. This one. Okay, so uh, I was going to wait for our department head Pierre, but I think he might be stuck in traffic. He was maybe he will join us later. So I'm officially opening the New York Token Kai meeting here at the Met, and I'm very happy that so many of the members are showing up. And uh, before we start, I want to also thank say thank you to my colleagues Catherine and our conservators Ted and Sean, who are willing to spend their precious Sunday here with us. Thank you, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I think that this is, uh, this is really great for the museum, this is great for, for Marcus, but I think that this is really exciting for us to be able to sort of uh, show off in such an intimate, although larger than I thought, setting, uh, it, much better than looking at them behind glass, I'm sure you will all agree. So uh, I'm sorry we can't have all the swords out. I'm sure you are too, but uh, perhaps we will be able to do this again if everything goes well today. So I'll give the floor back to Marcus, but thank you for coming. And I also would like to thank the club very much for uh, Connecting this with a little uh, donation to our department is always highly welcome because we are doing our own things. We are then we are able to like for example when you see the the online uh, presentation with the items that are online now on the website we were uh, able to we have our own little photo studio in the department so we were we were buying equipment with uh, donations so these were. Everything goes right to the department, and maybe we gotta see travel funding books, or and that's where I want to say thank you for for the donation by the club for today. So, uh, without further ado, I want to start about the, the background of why I picked this topic. So, when I was starting to get used to the collection uh, about seven months ago. And Pierre, I, I suggested to Pierre, the head of our department, if we can do a, a meeting here with the New York Token Kai. He was very positive right from the start and gave us gave me green light to proceed with this meeting. And then I was thinking about what would be a good a good uh, topic where we all also have items in the collection that would make a good display. And I am. Uh, picked the edges in Yasutsuka and the Shimusaka school because, uh, I mean, most of you know, of course, the master edges in Yasutsuka, but not so much is known about the origins of the Shimusaka school. And also we have in the collection about more than 15 uh, Shimusaka Yasutsuka school plates, of which I picked uh, five for today. So let's start with my little talk about the Yasutsuku and Shimosaka school. So, if you look into the sword books, those sword books will go a little bit into more detail, like for example mine, then you're gonna see that Yasutsuku is, is, is introduced in a nutshell as uh, that his family name was actually Shimosaka, that he came originally from Omi province, that he later moved to Echizen province, that he was then supported by uh, Shogun Tokugawa Ieyasu and that he was one of the greatest masters of the early Shinto era, the early 1600s. So that's a nutshell uh, Yasutsugu's career. So uh, at this point I wanna uh, wanna make a few comments about the, about what the lecture is gonna be. So my my aim is always to give some background information to connect the dots, uh, also uh, provide some historical background because I don't want to just intro, uh, use a cookie cutter approach and go slide by slide and say, oh, this school A has Miss B and he worked in workmanship C. So I try to avoid that and give a more uh, historical overview of the school. And my goal is not that after this meeting, everyone is able to Kante every Yasutsuku blade out there. So gonna okay, let's start with the with the talk. So uh, Shimusaka, 
Chimusaka was and actually still is uh, an area in Omi province. As you can see here, Omi province, <coughs> highlighted, is basically the region around Lake Biwa. And it corresponds one to one to what is present the uh, Shiga prefecture. Also, Shimosaka was also the name of the clan that was ruling this area in medieval times. Uh, and we go over here in more detail. This is Lake Biwa in the center, <coughs> and up here at the circle, this is the Shimosaka region. So, uh, right uh, at the time when the Kamakura shogunate was established by the Minamoto, that is at the end of the 12th century, one Minamoto branch uh, was given lands on the northeast shore of Lake Biwa. Right up here, right north to Shimosaka. Uh, four generations later, one of their descendants received these lands to the south, the Shimosaka, Shimosaka lands, and he changed his name, he adopted the, the, the regional name and changed his name from Minamoto no Moto Chika to Shimosaka Moto Chika. Also, the name Minamoto was, of course, kept as, a, as the traditional clan name, like, for example, Fujiwara in Taira. So, in short, the Shimosaka family, as a family of local feudal rulers, was established in the 13th century. Now we have to uh, fast forward 300 years to the Sengoku period, the age of warring states, when Japan experienced a state of near, near constant military conflicts. At this time, Omi province uh, not only saw uh, several battles, but it was also located right in the middle between Eastern and Western Japan. So also many armies passed through and as the province was important to several important hubs, there were quite some local struggles for power, as you can imagine. Uh, the Shimusaka rulers, they were allies, allies of, the, of the governor of Omi province, the Kyogoku family, but as they were not subordinate vessels to the Kyogoku, they also maintained uh, contact with the Kyogoku rivals, the Asai. These were the times, you have to know, where one better had a plan B and did not put all one's eggs into one basket, so to speak. So the Shimusaka were maintaining contacts with uh, all the local rulers. Now in, now in uh, 1581, so this is where, when you see here, Shimusaka was right here in the center where all the major routes from Kyoto to the north, from Kyoto to the to back then Kamakura and later to Edo. They were all gonna go past uh, Omi province and, and close to Shimosaka. So that is why this region was pretty important during the during the Sengoku period. So now in, in 1581 after uh, winning a few battles for Oda Nobunaga, uh, General Hori Hidemasa was rewarded with the lands that bordered to the south of the Shimosaka lands. Nobunaga died the year after in 1582, and so Hidemasa became a retainer of and a distinguished general of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, for whom he won several battles as well. As a reward for that, Three years later, Hideyoshi granted him the lands of Kitamosho in Echisen province. These lands were worth almost 10 times the lands Hidemasa had close to Shimosaka. And also an earthquake that had taken place in 1585 submerged, let me go back here. So the earthquake that took place in 1585 submerged all of the Shimosaka harbor. So uh, Hidemasa was probably happy to get out of there and move <laughs> up to Echisen. <laughs> and this is where the sword making comes into play. Uh, with the exception of some individual smiths or smaller groups, there had not been any distinguished school of swordsmanship 
uh, swords making uh, active in, in Omi province before the second half of the 16th century and before the Shimosaka school emerged. Uh, initially, the, the Shimosaka smiths were uh, focusing on the production of yari, uh, which reflects the demands of tent warfare, of course, when everything was uh, oriented towards large armies with uh, low trained Ashigaru wielding yari, there was a, a big demand uh, in, in yari. So, if you were a local ruler before, when there were no local schools around Lake Biwa, you were basically importing swords <coughs> from either Echisen, when you lived more to the north, or Wakasa, from Mino, of course, if you lived on the eastern shore, or Ise, or when you lived on the southern shore, you were probably importing <coughs> from Kyoto or Nara. And as you all know, these were all major sword production sites during the uh, 16th century. Uh, and now we're gonna arrive where uh, Yasutsuku comes into play. As mentioned earlier, his family name was Shimosaka and his first name was Ichi Saemon. We know from historic records that Yasutsuku was born in, in 1554 as son of the swordsmith Shimosaka Hachiro Saemon. Also, there are some sources, of course, like always, some say that he was actually the younger brother of Hachiro Saemon or his nephew. We don't know for sure, but for now we're gonna go with the theory that he was his son. So Hachiro Saemon, he was not a native of, of Shimosaka. He had moved there from a neighboring Mino province, where, so tradition has it, he was a smith of the Akasaka Senjuri school. Uh, he was most likely recruited by the local Shimosaka rulers at a time when the demand for swords increased and at a time when the rulers didn't want to be dependent on any of those uh, surrounding sources because Sengoku period, as you know, anything can change in one battle and usually and then suddenly you're stripped with the, from the supply chain of swords so you better have a few local masters working for you on the spot. So, uh, had this Hachiro Simon coming over to Omi, and he bore the Shimosaka family name as well. So, either he was granted it by the local rulers, or he was married into, or he married into the, into the Shimosaka family. Uh, and with his move, with the move of Shimosaka Hachiro Simon from Mino to Omi, given the Shimosaka family name, this is where the Shimosaka school basically starts and we can narrow it. We don't know for sure when he moved, but if he moved after 1554, then he brought his young son Yasutsugu with him. If he moved there before 1554, Yasutsugu was born in Shimosaka. Of course, there's always more. It's always not that easy with the, so with the traditions about uh, the origins of certain schools. There's also a complete whole different legend about how the Shimosaka school came into being. One says, uh, one that goes back to the, uh, the Shimosaka family of local rulers. They claim that one of their ancestors was invited by Emperor Gotoba, the Emperor Gotoba who started his Goba and Kachi project, to forge with him at the Imperial Palace. And later on, when their descendants, one of their descendants returned from the invasion of Korea in 1592, returned to his lands in Omi, he realized that the power of his family was dwindling and in order to survive, he had the idea to go all in with the sword, with the sword making passion of his family and so he hired a Mino Smith to work for him and to train his own son, who was Yasutsugu. So this is the whole other tradition about the emergence of the Yasutsugu school. But, there is a big but. We have historic records from 1582 that say that the Shimosaka family of swordsmiths was already there in 1573. So it was 20 years before the Korean invasion. So this basically rules out the, the more romantic tradition of the family that it was their ancestors working with Emperor Gotoba in the past 
and that this was the origins of the Simosaka school. So, just uh, in 1573, this document, Yasutsuko was 19 years old, so it's very, very much possible that he was uh, already there working as a smith in Shimosaka. Uh, all this document also mentions that Hachiro Saimon, Yasutsuko's father, was working for Tanaka Yoshimasa for the salary, the high salary of 200 koku. Uh, this is Tanaka Yoshimasa, another Sengoku era general. And Yoshimasa, like Hidemasa, was given lands by Hideyoshi at Lake Omi, uh, at Lake Biwa in Omi province. Yoshimasa received lands too somewhat to the south of the, of the Shimosaka lands. So, uh, but now when, 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 now when Hori Hidemasa was given the Kitano Shoreloins in Echizen in 1585, we don't know for sure which Smith moved where and at what point in time. We only know that Hidemasa entered Omi and Shimosaka in 1581 and four years later later ended up in the north and Tanaka Yoshimasa moved there in 1585 right when Hidemasa moved up north Yoshimasa later moved to uh, Mikawa province for a while and then later his final move was down uh, to Kyushu to Chikugo province and there is one uh, Chuyo Naginata extent by Yasutsugu's supposed alleged father that was made down on Kyushu for uh, assumed to be a local samurai in 1603. So by 1603 Yasutsugu's father was already working down here. And I had the chance to study this Naginata maybe a little over 10 years ago. And it's no, it's Naginata has, has a great workmanship. It is Chuyo, and as you can see, it looks very pristine. It even has the, it even has this, the Tagane Makura, the the metal left that is pushed away by the chisel. So it is in a very, very good condition as it made as it was made like 50 years ago. So now we come to the point. where we have to think about when, when Yasutsugu moved to Echisen and where his career was going from there. After the, the mother of all battles, after Sekigahara in 1600s, the lands up here, Kito no Sho, were given to uh, Iyasu's son, uh, Yuki Hideyasu. He was the second son of, of, of Iyasu, and for me, it appears it is more likely that when Yasutsuko entered Echisen that he doesn't he didn't uh, come up with the idea to hire a smith from his former former local ruler that was way back in Omi. I think he was most likely hired by Hideyasu because he was already there in Echisen. It would make much more sense than than Yuki Hideyasu calling for Yasutsuko to move from Omi up to Echisen. <coughs> So, uh, also, there are several local uh, smiths in, from Aitchison who received the honorary, the same honorary di uh, title, Higo Daicho. And also, we don't know when, H when Yasutsugu received it. Some say it was in the 1590s. Others think it was after he was hired by, by Yuki Hideyasu. Uh, but the historic background is that when Yuki Hideyasu entered Echisen and all of the Tokugawa grabbed as much of Japan as possible after Sekigahara, <coughs> he was he tried to strengthen his lands. He tried to he was rebuilding uh, the Kitano Sho Castle, the local castle, which was a venture that took him six years, and he turned it, it was then renamed into Fukui which is the name of the present uh, prefecture, Fukui prefecture. 
and he was probably realizing that there were several very promising smiths on his lands and I think it started with him uh, encouraging them, tapping his potential, giving three of them or four of them honorary titles, titles and make them famous throughout the country. Also we know that Yuki Hideyasu, somewhere around 1605, 1607, he arranged it that his father, the Shogun Ieyasu, and, Sho and, and Ieyasu's successor, uh, that Yasutsugu uh, proceed to Edo to forge under the presence of, of Ieyasu and his, and his successor. And this is the blade accent, it's an important cultural object that uh, Yasutsugu made after this meeting and offered it to the, <coughs> to the Atsuda Shrine in Nagoya. There on this plate, he inscribed in detail that he made it under the presence of the Shogun and the Shogun's son, that he received the, <coughs> the honor to engrave the crest of the Tokugawa on the tanks, and he also mentioned that he received, uh, on this occasion, the character for Yasu, that he formed his name Yasutsugu hands uh, from now on. Because before the time, he was just signing with Echuzen no Kuni Shimosaka or Echuzen no Kuni Hyuga Daicho Shimosaka. And this brings us back to the honorary title. If he had received the honorary title Higo Daicho as well on this occasion, he would probably have mentioned it somewhere on the tank. That's why I assume he had received that title before and not on this prestigious meeting with the Shogun. Uh, when we go to the uh, historic uh, documents like the Tokugawa diary, we can pretty much nail it down at what point in time Ieyasu and his uh, successor, his son, were in Edo at the same time. And they were there only from the 10th month of 1605 to the 3rd month of 1606, and then again from the ninth month of 1606 to the second month of 1607. So at one of those times, this was where they met with Yasutsugu and had him forge on the spot. And Yasutsugu, it is assumed that he made this blade on his way back to Echisen, which was, would then have probably been somewhere around 1607, 1608. Let's go back a few slides. Yeah, if he was making the blades here in Edo with the presence of the Shogun and his son, he would have passed by Nagoya anyway. So either he took the, the route here, he took the route here, <coughs> stopped by at the temple, made the presentation plates, celebrating his honor, and then go way up back to Echisen province. So let's bring a little timeline into play here. This is 1585 when Hori Hidemasa leaves Omi for Echisen. This is then when Tokoyama's, uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu's second son was given the lands after Sekigahara. This is probably when Yasutsuko proceeded to Edo to get his great honor of receiving the Yasu character. And the peak of all the extant dated plates they pretty much focuses around this year 1614. And then something important happened for Ieyasu's career. Osaka Castle fell and was taken by the Tokugawa. And at this, at this battle, uh, parts of the castle were burned and all and many of the famous swords that Hideyoshi had accumulated there and they were now taken care of by his family were damaged by fire, damaged in the fire. So Hideyasu, uh, Ieyasu approached Yasutsugu and asked him that he should reharden some of these master blades that were damaged in fire. We have an historic record extent that say, quote unquote, hired for this task shall be the Smith Shimosaka, uh, receiving the princely wage of 500 gold coins plus 2,000 silver coins for this job. And they have to know, Yasutsugu already received 40 koko a year from the HSN, from his HSN employer, and a stipend from Ieyasu in the height 
of a support for 50 persons, so he was doing pretty fine for a small swordsmiths of the time. Re re also receiving 500 gold coins and 2,000 silver coins just for the rehardening job. Uh, as for rehardening, Saiha, as most of you probably know, uh, when a blade is exposed to fire, uh, to heat for an extended period of time, like in a, in a building burning down, and then cooling off as the fire burns out slowly, the structure of the steel changes. It changes back to the uh, unhardened condition. I'm not gonna go into the metallurgical details, but if a Japanese blade is carefully forged, you can reharden such a blade four, five, six times. And it was done, it was done all the time in the past, because if a blade was was burned and it was able to and you were able to reharden it, there's no way to throw it away. Because you just reharden it and then you have a you have a weapon again. Uh, a blade that can use as a weapon. But Yasutsugu here, of course, Yasutsugu had a whole different challenge, but he, wa he was asked to recreate <coughs> masterworks. So he had to go study the workmanship of the masters, try to get uh, old Oshigata drawings to see how the Hamon may have looked like on the originals, and to <coughs> recreate them as faithfully as possible. And in this course, and as also asked by Yasu, he made copies of these famous blades. He made copies of the of all these famous maple, so he rehardened and of some more because a few copies already started here in 1614. So yeah, he was making copies of blades when they were still undamaged, and then was later asked to do more copies. In in the course of which he was he was receiving another. He was uh, getting another patron on board, uh, Honda Narishige. He also ordered some copies from Yasutsugu. So he making some more money at this time, at this point in time, by making all these copies. And Narishige, by the way, Narishige, by the way, he granted Ieyasu the rights to engrave his family crest on his hands. So that's why we sometimes see famous Yasutsugu blades who have two family crests. One is the one of the Tokugawa and one is the one of the local Echisen, uh uh, Karo Elder Narishige. So let's now go over to the copies. Just to do a little, uh, do a little statistics before we wrap it up and go over to the blades. Uh, Seventy-five blades of Ayasutsugu have passed to you so far, and twenty-two of them are, are copies of masterworks. So. Pretty much a third are copies. Twelve blades are Tokubetsu Chuyo, and four of them are copies, so again about a, th a third. Fifteen Chuyo Bichutsu Hin blades exist by Yagusutsugu. Three of them are copies of famous blades. And they, they, all, the, all the, the two Chuyo Bunkasai by Yagusutsugu, they are both copies. So also, when we take, of this, take a look at all these copies together, we learn that he was focusing on four smiths in, uh, and that in a quantitative, quantitative order uh, Soshu Sadamune, Awataguchi Yoshimits, Masamune, and Sancho Mune Chika. With the far most copies he made uh, concern Soshu Sadamune. That's the largest group of all the copies, and then come then there's a big gap, and then come a few copies of Atakuchi, Yoshimitsu, Masamune, and Sanjo Munechika. So Yasutsuko was, he was already 61 years old at the time Osaka fell, uh, and he died uh, six years later in 1621 at the age of, of 67. So this is the peak, the peak of his career, these seven years here, where he made all these fancy copies, all this all the blades that are, most of the blades that passed Chuyo and those who received government designation, they were, most of them were made at this, at this part in his career. Uh, also very interesting with the copies is that he copied blades that do no longer exist. So we only know them from even a few old Oshigata drawings or by the, uh, the copies Yasutsugu left. For example, this blade is supposed to be a copy of a, of a famous Sadamune called Baichiku Sadamune Baichiku means bamboo, uh, means bamboo and plum because of the hormona, obviously. And here you can, here you see the Tokugawa crest, 
and the Honda Crest because he made it, he mentioned it, made it for Honda Hida no Kami. There is another blade, Yasutsubu, pretty often copied, and this is the Meibutsu Ataki Salamune. It's an interesting blade, no longer extant. It's, uh, as you can see, it's Koshin Kata Kiribatsukuri, one age, one, uh, one side Shinobi, one side Kiribatsukuri, and he made a few of these copies here again, both crests made for Honda, and the interesting thing is there is one blade by Sadamune extant. It's a Chuyu Bunkasai, very famous. It's called Kiriha Sadamune, because here again, one, one side is in Kiribatsukuri. And in the past, it was often assumed that Yasutsugu just copied this blade and spiced it up with a few, with, a, oops, with different horimono. But actually, later it was found out that Yasutsugu didn't copy the Kiriha Sadamune. He was copying the Ataki Sadamune. So if you see in some older texts, a blade like this, which says a uh, copy of the Kiriha Sadamune, but actually looks like this with all this, this horimono, then you know it was, it's not, he, di he didn't uh, copy the, the Kiriha, he copied the Ataki Sadamune. He also copied another famous Sadamune blade, the Shishi Sadamune. <coughs> The one is Tokubei Chuchuyu, the copy on the right. And he also, there's an interesting thing, he also brought in a little variety. He, done, he, only, he did not copy those plates all the time, one by one to one, faithfully. He always, uh, he made, for example, he adop adopted the, the Ataki Salamune style and made a wakisashi out of it, and things like that. And this is uh, a famous play by Sancho Monechika. It's called the Ibina Kokachi. This is uh, copied by Yasutsugu, as you can see, a little different here. He brings up the suken as the relief in the he further up. But there is also a copy by Yasutsugu extant, which is a true faithful copy of the Ibina Kokachi. So, and now we're gonna. I want to talk a little bit about this, the, the blades we have here on this blade today. We have five blades, all of course as mentioned by the school. We have one blade by Higo Daicho Sadakuni, Amume Wakisashi. And Higo Daicho Sadakuni is an interesting case because we don't know much about him. We, he bore the same honorary title. It appears that he was slightly senior to Yasutsugu. There was the theory in the past that they were both the same Smith that Yasutsugu first signed with Sadakuni and then with Yasutsugu, but there is some overlap with dated blades, <coughs> which suggests that there were two different smiths, actually. So we have the, we have, and also Sada, Sadakuni was, uh, was a pretty good smith. We have nine blades by him past Chuyu, there is, and there is one uh, Chuyu Bichu to him by him. Then we have One blade by the first generation Yasutsugu on the table. We have two blades by the third generation Edo Yasutsugu. And then we have a blade on the table, a very interesting blade by uh, Sadatsugu, who was a student of, of, of Yasutsugu. And the interesting thing of the Sadatsugu blade is, you will see later on the table, it's interesting Hamon. Because this is a copy, uh, this is a, a blade by the first generation Yasutsugi in, inter, interpreted in a hamon, which they call either Hako Midare, Angular Midare, or they call it Uma no Ha Midare, Horse Teeth Midare. And he pretty freely draws from Sadamune and, and Masamune interpretations, where you can see a little bit already of this horse teeth, but he also, he blew it up and made like a very wide, flamboyant horse teeth hamon with here is tassels towards the end and at the Sadatsugu plate that is on the table later you will see that Sadatsugu took, took it even a step further and isolated those, turned it into a huge tobiyaki. So it's a very interesting plate, I like it very much. So and this should be the end of the talk. Uh, are there uh, any questions about the 
Yasutsubu Shimusaka School. No questions, it's good. <laughs> okay. Question, yep. Just because I'm not real familiar with the school. Mm -hmm. How far how far forward did the school progress? They actually say in Yasutsubu School split up into two lineages with the third generation and both one working in Echisen, one working in Edo. Both were working for the Shogunate and they were 12th and 9th generation respectively until the end of the Edo period. So they existed till all the way through the end of the Edo period. Marco, sometimes we see work that assigned uh, Yamashiro no Kuni Shimasaka uh, Saku. Yeah. Uh, is this from that split that you was just talking about, or there was uh, something else? Yeah, this the split of the split of the Shimosaka school goes back to this background at the end of the Sengoku period, when local rulers were transferred and took the smiths with them. Some ended up here. There are some over there in Musashi province, so that's why we have Shimosaka smiths all over the place with entering the Edo period. Of the uh, masterpieces that Yasutsugo recap, do yep. they exhibit Mizukage? They do not exhibit that much Mizukage like we would see at the Horikawa school, but there are there are some. You can see there's a slight Mizukage, but it's not it's not very prominent. As far as those that I have seen in person, it's not very not that prominent. Yep. Uh, it seems to me that I've seen a lot of Aichi Zen and Shimosaka blades. Mm -hmm. Uh, not by Yasutsugu per yeah. se, but are also katakiri mm -hmm. Was this was he the trendsetter for that copying these Sadamune? And yeah, I think it fell into the time when many smiths tried to recreate social blades in the Momoyama period, and then you have the first the first uh, Oshigata compilations were distributed, and you have all this Meibutsu, and many of them in Kiribati, Korea, and, and in, uh, in, imposing magnificent wakisashi forms. So that also played into here. So I, th I don't, it, it was like both Yasutsuko making already copies on the spot and then the fashion of the time. Okay. So when we go over to the plates, I will now give the stage to Ted who wants to. Do you want to talk about this first? Yeah, we can talk about the, about the Glotopolis <coughs> first. So for the fittings, People, we got out here a box where, <laughs> back in the past, if you were a wealthy daimyo or samurai and he wanted you, and you want to make a special present, for example, for marriage, you don't want to just present one amito koromono or one set of menuki. You're going to present sets by every generation and put them in one box, and that's what we have here. Our department has overall four of these boxes and much of the fittings you see in the galleries, the golden generations, they were stored in these boxes, that's why they are partially empty. And we're going to unbox one of those boxes so that you can see how this was stored. It's very sophisticated and neat. And we got another box here I was going to uh, have here on display because the one we're gonna open this is half empty but over the weekend it locked itself and we can't open it anymore <laughs> when? because friday i had friday i had the, 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 the right box open to check and then i closed it then went home for the weekend and now it's locked and we have to figure out how to open it <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really. so <laughs> unfortunately um, you can see the the the, uh, the box well, you look at it going to be open, we're going to have a, some drawers sticking out. But this one, we can still open. Okay. So, do you want me to do it while you sort of talk through it? Oh yeah, you can do it. And maybe we, I don't we can get up and, and yeah, make so a little circle around. Yeah, so you can view it a little bit. Yeah. Fifteenth is there and not the, the last two generations, so it predates the last two. Wow. So. Yeah. There is, if, if some of you have been at the Genshi show upstairs, there is this big uh, giant palanquin and it has a little video clip to the side where it shows where Princess 
uh, Atsuhime was married into the Tokugawa family, and it shows how they transport, they walk through Edo, and she bring, they're bringing all the gifts into the marriage. This would be one of those gifts. You will have a ceremonial box with all the gold of fittings, all the generations. And there's going to be a big kiri box. It has a fancy cloth in there nice. mm. that goes around uh -huh. lacquer boxes. So you just mar married Princess Atsuhime, oh. and then you see, what did you bring into the marriage? <laughs> <laughs> Saying, oh, well, let's open this. So it kind of has a lacquer box with a lock. This one is open. This, one. Yeah, this lock doesn't work. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then there's some more in there. Move this over. Oh. Lacquer's come coming off. Lacquer's mm. coming off. Yeah. Mm. We hardly ever handle these, and so of course then you get it out and it changes the climate, changes the environment. I'm sure you've seen this thing happen okay. before with lacquer. So mm. on top of it, we have a special small lacquer box with what you want, with mm. all the origami, yeah, wow. nice. because you want to have it certified. Mm. I think there are 13 or 14 mm -hmm. individual in there. Yeah. And they are here in there too in the lowermost drawer, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This set, uh, this box, by the way, is for uh, Mitokuro Mono. So you have all the, you have 15 Mitokuro Mono in there. Most of them are on display, but here I think there are four or five in there. But I'm, I'm sorry that it's not open today. And then you get the second box. That you have all the Menuki. It says the older generation starting from right to left. You this show. It's not a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They have mm. the 15th generation, Yujo, Sojo, Joshin, all the way down. So they uh, yeah. would have been pinned in, well, uh, tied in, I guess. That top one's a little stiff here. Let me yeah. pull this one out. So you can see two of these are still in position. The rest are on display. I think at the nice. bottom. The the bottom. Bo yeah, I thought I could take this one out. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. Show. Mm -hmm. Bottom one oh, oh. slid out of position there. Mm -hmm. There we go. So. Mm, nice. Yeah. So, okay, what are we looking at? Because I can't see anything. <laughs> 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 Is it Minuki? Or yes. Yeah, those are Minuki. Minuki. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, those are uh, Mitoko Romono, and the other two boxes that we have in the collection are both Kosuka, Kosuka boxes by the 15th generation. So if you are, like if you want to make a big impression, a statement, you just give someone four of these boxes as a gift. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how you collect them. Yeah. <laughs> Could we pass through, like make a? Oh yeah, line? yeah. It was just for the opening. Oh okay. This one is, uh, <coughs> this one is display only. I mean, you can bend over, look at it, uh, but the minuki are supposed to stay on the mm -hmm. on the drawer, mm -hmm. please. And Ted was going to say a few words about the source. Yes. So if you could clear us this way a little bit for me. So we have, a, as you see, five blades laid out. Um, you've got some people who are already putting on gloves and masks. Because these are <coughs> a museum collection, we have to take sort of an extra level of care with them. I mean, your own swords, if you wish to hold them and look at them how you wish, that's great. But for our purposes, no. We have to kind of treat it with a, yep. uh, that extra level because they don't really belong to us. So we insist on masks, we insist on gloves. And if you could line up this way and then just slowly proceed from left to right, giving the person in front of you plenty of space so we don't have any accidents with the swords. I would be very grateful if no one got hurt. Um, each sword has a, uh, a cloth there for, for use. And, uh, you know, cycle through. Uh, in an orderly fashion, I mean, everyone uh, should have a chance to, to uh, vote. Photo request, if you're taking photos, just make sure your phone is not above the blade. Yep. So it's, it's, it's not a drop. No, oh, yeah. gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, if there's anybody that's uh, unfamiliar with the blade, most of us are, but uh, 
Washington DC, so it's a, it's a compliment to us, and it also says a lot about uh, your own organization that you can bring um, so many of you together to look at objects. Um, our collection is deep. Uh, we're trying to do what we can to put it online, but we know there's nothing like having the object in hand, and um, we want to build um, a relationship that allows us to share more of what we have. We, we know you appreciate, and uh, it was very it was very exciting for us too to be working towards this goal of making this happen. So, um, thank you again. We have a, a list here um, if you want to leave your contact information. In general, our department wants to open up. We want to communicate better. We're always active. We're doing a number of things, not always with Japanese objects, but in other directions as well. It's trying to put together a newsletter. We have events. We have creative friends group. So we have a number of initiatives. If you care to know about what we're up to, if you want to leave your contact information, 
we'll send you material, and of course you can unsubscribe if you find that uh, an annoyance. But we're generally looking forward to getting to know you all better. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.